they'd lost their credit card while on travel in Montreal. They had their uh, wallet stolen in Montreal, right? And they actually uh, called the bank to block the card, but looks like the block did not go through. Welcome to the e-commerce coffee break podcast. In today's episode, we discuss why e-commerce fraud prevention solutions reduce chargebacks and how they improve the shopper experience. Joining me on the show are Harish Manipelli, Chief Technology Officer and Tariq Ahmed, Managing Director for Canada at Zumigo.com. And uh, they were not aware of this transaction at all. So let's dive right into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to dive into a very important topic for a lot of merchants out there and a lot of merchants probably have dealt with this issue. We want to talk about fraud and fraud prevention solutions. Now, a huge topic, fraud is on the rise. Um, big numbers there. I just saw a number this morning saying that online payment fraud is predicted to hit 13 billion US dollars by 2024, so this year. So that's huge. And to dive into this topic, I have some experts with me. With me is Harish Manipelli um, and Tariq Ahmed. Both are, the, from, the, are from Sumigo.com and they're expert when it comes to fraud protection. So I'd like to welcome them to the show. Hi guys, how are you today? Good, hi, how are you doing? Nice to meet you, Klaus. Excellent. Maybe Tariq, start with you. Just give me in a short sentence a bit of a, your background, where you're coming from and what your expertise is. Sure. So. Um... So I've been with Zumigo for four years. Prior to that, I've worked with companies like Western Union, Amazon, uh, solving their fraud problems. Um, and I've, I think I've been passionate about solving fraud problems from my high school days, right? So I, um, I did a project back in my school where we're trying to solve a fraud problem by uh, now, which is famously called as 3D Secure, but yeah, entering a PIN code as a second factor authentication to a card transaction. So I've been interested in card not present fraud, uh, and I've always been interested in building out systems and tools um, to detect or to basically deter card not present fraud. So that's mm -hmm. my background. Uh, I've been exposed to different types of uh, card not present fraud, payment fraud, and different fraud scenarios, and gained good experience working with some big companies and with companies like Zumigo uh, solving these problems. Okay, Harish, what about you? Yeah, thank you, Klaus. Uh, good, good to be on the podcast. Uh, so I've been with Zumigo for a little over eight years in two different stints, uh, building identity verification solutions. Zumigo started out with an API-based platform, which fintechs, mostly banks, used. And a lot of the identity verification problems that you find in the banking space carry over quite nicely into the e-commerce space because fraudsters are, you know, they're trying to hack into accounts. So we've solved a number of problems in the in the banking space from new account opening, uh, login ver login verification, and we've taken a bunch of you know these and you know got them over into in, into the e-commerce space. So uh, at, at Zumigo, I've led led uh, development in the past, and now I'm focused on e-commerce initiatives, trying to build solutions for the different shopping platforms, and also building uh, strong authentication solutions. I was at Amazon for a little while where I was responsible for workforce identity solutions. So is a different side of this thing where you're not necessarily uh, authenticating shoppers, but you're making sure that people working inside warehouses, the employees are getting authenticated. So I'm kind of, you gotten exposed to both sides of authentication. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of merchants out there, and that includes me, I had some cases there, you have to deal with fraud in one or the other way. And if you're not used to it, it becomes a bit of a surprise what's happening there. And as you said, fraudsters are everywhere. They're very creative. Tell me about what are the some uh, some of the common fraud tactics and schemes that Shopify merchants or online merchants in general, general face today? Sure. I think the biggest uh, right now is still payment fraud. Um, so it's nothing but getting access to someone's uh, card information or banking information and using that to make a purchase, right? So that's the biggest, I would still say that's the biggest uh, cause of payment fraud. Uh, and it's very easy to get stolen credit cards these days, right? So dark web uh, people, fraudsters go on dark web, buy a bunch of stolen credit cards. Uh, they do card testing. They try to test those cards on different platforms. They automate the whole the whole thing. Uh, they're very sophisticated. Uh, so when you're thinking about Froster, they're sophisticated. They have all the tools and platforms uh, to do this, right? So payment card has has been uh, the biggest issue in the industry. 
uh, where stolen credit cards are being used to make purchases, right? So that's one type of fraud. The other would be account takeover, right? Stolen credentials. So you get access to someone's username and password. Um, you log into the account, you make purchases using safe credit cards, safe PII data, uh, and then you bypass security, right? You go ahead and make um, buy an item, ship it to your address, use someone else's credit, someone else's payment instrument and details, uh, and you, uh, that leads to a chargeback as well. Uh, and I think right now, uh, it's got a, a lot more sophisticated where uh, synthetic ID has come into place, right? So it's stitching different pieces of legitimate information and creating a, a good synthetic ID where it becomes difficult for uh, fraud prevention solutions to detect this information. So that's why I think it gets becomes critical to use uh, fraud prevention tools and up-to-date fraud prevention tools and technologies to deter and detect this fraud. Mm -hmm. Now, collecting customer data um, is a standard practice. Personalization is a big topic everywhere. Yeah. Everyone should have a personalized um, customer experience on your online store. However, you as a business, you as a merchant, you carry the responsibility of protecting the data. What are the key challenges in balancing fraud protection with a smooth customer experience when it comes to personalization in your online store? Yeah, so so the way our product plays in, there are two parts to this. So the customer facing feature is the passwordless login, right? Mm -hmm. so that's where a, a customer interacting with the merchant engages uh, engages with the merchant's website. The other part is an order risk verification where there is no customer interaction at all. It's completely transparent. When as soon as an order is placed on a Shopify website, uh, DRiskify automatically yeah, gets the order order details and immediately does a real time scoring of the different risk aspects about the customer, about the order, the different uh, pieces of information that are available in the order that's placed by the customer, right? So from, from uh, you know protecting a, a customer's uh, data, obviously as a merchant, you want to collect as little information as possible, but you also want to be careful that when somebody creates an account for the very first time, right? And depending on the, the value of the goods that you typically sell on your store, do you want to make sure that you will let anybody with an email create an account or do you want to do a little bit more of a verification before that account is created, right? So uh, it's a fine balance that depends on the type of merchant you are for higher value goods where you potentially require a login to place an order. You do want to do a little bit of verification. You can collect some information, make sure that person who's creating the account is authentic. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a score, a trust score or a score to find out um, if you basically want to transact or fulfill the, the transaction, fulfill the order. What does that mean? How does this kind of score work? What kind of elements are involved to come to a rating? I think we use a lot of uh, data. When I say a lot of data, is we... Get, we use data from different touch points from a customer journey. Uh, so it's basically, we we have insights into device possession. We validate uh, if the consumer has uh, access to the device, we validate the name and address on uh, a particular phone number. So we, we cross-reference shipping and billing addresses with the name and address provided on a phone number. We get email reputation. We have uh, uh, information on, we get information and we validate uh, information on email. Uh, if that email has been uh, part of a previous suspicious transaction or fraudulent transaction, we get those flags from our data partners. We take uh, geodesic distances, distances between IP addresses and billing addresses. We validate the payment instrument. Um, so we do the traditional address verification checks uh, if the AVS matches. We also um, validated the name on card matches. So we... So we tie into different aspects of a transaction and we validate uh, all that information and uh, used our advanced uh, analytics and um, uh, algorithms to come up with a trust score, right? So the higher the score is, the more trustworthy the transaction is. The more for a merchant, uh, they can approve that transaction or approve that order with more confidence. Uh, and then we have lower uh, trust scores, which means this transaction is not good. Uh, and our recommendation is to uh, decline uh, the transaction or it's up to the merchant, right? So we provide a trust score 
the merchant has the option of declining the transaction, declining the order, or getting additional in information from the consumer before processing the order. So like, yeah, I think the trust score comprises of different attributes, um, uh, different attributes during the transaction, during the order uh, touch point. We use all that information to validate against our real-time data sources. And I think I'd like to add one point is a lot of other um, uh, other providers who use historic data, uh, pattern-based recognition. So we, along with that, also validate real-time authoritative data, right? So we validate if it's a yes or a no question. Does this name and address match with the name and address on a phone number provided against uh, telco providers? Um, and does this the billing address, name and address matches with the name and address provided, right? So that's kind of authoritative data we provide and also does this consumer have access to the phone number they've uh, provided as part of their checkout? So that's the authoritative real-time data we validated along with a lot of historic and pattern based. So the combination of that too gives enough confidence for us to provide uh, a, a good confident trust code back to our merchants. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds like there's a lot of data going on and obviously it's for the best of the merchant and it's also for the best of potentially somebody who has been scammed out of his credit card details. Yeah. So there's a lot of data protection in there. But the, how does Sumingo um, ensure compliance with regulations, know your customer, data privacy laws? How does that work? We, we adopt uh, the common standards, the CCPA, the GDPR, uh, and there is disclosure on what sorts of data are retained, how long we retain it and how often the data gets cleaned up. The merchant has complete visibility into what is stored. Uh, we have strong data protection uh, at, in place where we keep the data. Uh, so it's, it's completely up to the merchant, how long the data is stored and what is stored. And then the, the consumer at any point can go request for data deletion and that's standard practice using CCPA or GDPR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, just to add to that, right? So um, we've uh, Zumigo has been in business for over ten years. We've we've been working with uh, bigger FIs and um, uh, other businesses, bigger financial institutions, banks. So we have um, periodic audits to validate how we are storing our data. We, we I think we're pretty compliant on that. We go through regular audits and make sure all the data is safely, securely. Um, uh, stored and erased as per uh, the requirements. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to understand why a merchant should have a um, fraud protection system. Can you share any kind of success stories or case studies? You don't name, name brands um, from merchants that have implemented your solution? Sure. I can share an interesting story where uh, with one of our early customers, we were validating our product uh, and we were getting feedback on every decision. So let's say we, initially we were validating our product, our trust scores, we were getting feedback. So this is a mobility company who sells uh, electronic scooters. Mm -hmm. So um, they noticed a transaction of between $1,300 to $1,400 uh, dollar transaction for an e-scooter uh, getting sent. And this is in Canada, right? So this was uh, getting sent to Montreal, Quebec. Uh, and we had information on the name and address being from Ottawa, the capital city of Canada. Uh, so I think based on details did not match, right? The phone number was provided. Uh, the, the consumer trying to make this purchase could not validate the phone number. They provided the name and address of the card holder. So definitely that match, but they didn't have a device possession. We saw the billing and shipping distances were far apart, right? It was in different provinces altogether. Uh, we provided a risk score of decline. And, and then the our merchant ended up calling the cardholder to validate uh, if this is actually a good transaction. And they did say that they'd lost their credit card while on travel in Montreal. They had their uh, wallet stolen in Montreal, right? And they actually uh, called the bank to block the card, but looks like the block did not go through. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were not aware of this transaction at all. Like they were not aware of this transaction, this purchase. So the merchant went ahead and immediately canceled the order. Uh, so that saved the merchant $1,300. Um, actually, I would say more than $1,300 because what would happen is if they would have processed the transaction, they're losing inventory worth $1,300. And there would be a potential chargeback 
uh, because the merchant processed a fraudulent order. And in this case, the merchant is liable to return the money back to the cardholder, right? So it's a significant uh, financial uh, impact uh, the product caused uh, for um, this merchant. And I think the, the biggest attribute for us is they also had other default um, providers, which Shopify provides. Uh, all their recommendation was the transaction is good. And that's because there was no historic uh, fraudulent uh, fraudulent signal on that particular customer or that particular order, right? So this is one uh, small example of how a merchant uh, merchant user trust score and uh, helped uh, help stop a chargeback in a fraudulent process of fraudulent order. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes transactions get flagged by the payment processor automatically. So Stripe yeah. flags it for no reason. So that the, the guest, um, the, the, the customer did not come through and uh, did flag the transaction. And, and you're coming from the banking system. So you have a bank, banking background. How does that work? How can you um, protect flagging a, a payment on the gateway side of things? So you're right. So I think Stripe right now has a lot more rules. So as a merchant, you can configure that rules on how, so they're giving merchants uh, flexibility to, I think they call it radar, Stripe radar. So they're giving merchants the flexibility to add your own rules, uh, add your own um, factors to flag a transaction or decline a transaction. Uh, but again, I think the decision solely lies on Stripe and their internal fraud uh, systems and models. Eventually, if you see that uh, this merchant has a good history of processing good transactions. Um, I think, so what Stripe would do, or I'm potentially guessing what Stripe would do is be a little more lenient on their fraud risk rules, right? So two aspects of it. If you have your own fraud solution, you're sending Stripe good, good transactions to process. They don't see a lot of fraud coming from you. Uh, so the lesser the payment processor will flag your transaction, right? But if you see a lot of fraud volume coming from you, uh, they would have their rules, they'll stick in their rules. You'll see a lot more transactions being flagged because uh, potentially you're sending a lot more higher, higher fraud volume to them. So I think that's why it becomes critical for you as a merchant to invest in other fraud solutions, fraud providers. And before even you send the transaction to the processor, make sure that the order is good. Yeah, I think that's that's a good um, explanation that you gave there. So if you're coming with good data and you prevent yeah. fraud in the first place, it will not have any kind of negative impacts on other sites, for instance, payment gateways yeah. in, in your business. So that's a, a big point there. Let's dive a little bit into the practical implementation of your system into a Shopify store. How does that look like? What are the steps that a merchant has to go through to get it up and running? Yeah, so it's um, it's an app. You go into the Shopify app marketplace, search for de-riskify, and once you 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 find it, you click install. It's uh, self-guided. There is no code integration required. As soon as you install it, you you basically review the terms of the app, uh, pick a, a plan, and uh, we've got multiple plans based on what sort of services you're interested in, and you click sign up. Then once you sign up, it's installed. And the next time an order is placed, you automatically get an order risk indicator from DRiskify. Uh, we've got a couple of different flavors in which you can see it. One is we post that indicator directly into the Shopify uh, merchant uh, dashboard. Mm -hmm. And you can also uh, drill down, open up our UI, which is integrated into the console. So once you launch the DRiskify UI, you can explore multiple different aspects of your overall business. So we've got a dashboard which shows the total number of transactions you've performed, how many have been uh, flagged as risky, the total dollar amount of the ris risky transactions. Uh, so it's a visual tool which will allow the merchant to go make a decision. There is a summary and there's also a detailed drill down. No code integration is required. We do have options where if a larger merchant wants to integrate with an SDK of sorts, that is available. But from the get-go, our order risk management has uh, you know, no code integration. And you can get up and running within a couple of minutes. Okay, that sounds very, very straightforward. Specifically, no code integration or not, nothing that you need to do from your side. I love, I love that. Who's your perfect customer? Are there specific industries or verticals that you work more with than others? 
Sure. I think the way we've um, designed this no-code integration is to, uh, so like like Harish mentioned, we also have APIs and SDKs, which requires a lot of integrations and larger enterprises would want to uh, do that. Uh, but with the Shopify platform, it's uh, more with this no-code integration and the app, it is uh, designed towards uh, mid-scale businesses, small and mid-scale businesses because uh, they 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 would want a fraud protection solution, but without the investment and effort of going through an entire integration, developing, uh, hiring engineers to develop the solution. So the app is mainly uh, around these kind of businesses, but that doesn't mean large enterprises cannot use the same functionality. Uh, so it is focused towards the SMB businesses. Um, we, and I think we have a lot of customers. We have varied customers. We have customers who sell health devices, general merchandise, sports equipment. So we have customers all over the place. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, so it, it's not meant for a specific industry or specific business. We can do uh, this validation for any consumer, right? So we are validating a consumer, not necessarily a type of product they're ordering, but the consumer on uh, our system. So it could be, any consumer facing uh, business on Shopify. Mm -hmm. I want to take one step back. Um, Harshi, at some point you mentioned that you have a password less login feature in your system. What does that mean and how does that work? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So there are like two parts to our solution, right? One is the order risk verification, which is backend only. That's That's got uh, pretty much zero uh, consumer interaction during order verification. We do have a feature where a, a, a verification message can be sent out to a customer where they actually confirm they bought the product. That's mm -hmm. an additional signal which the merchant has a confidence level. Uh, so that's the one user interaction as a consumer you would see for order risk verification. On the password list, uh, you know, Shopify offers uh, a couple of different flavors, right? One is an email-based OTP login, and the other one is a classic login where they say you can log in with the username and password, right? So what we've done is we've, we've basically taken the passwordless solution and made it available as part of the de-riskify, where once a merchant installs the app, you can select a passwordless login solution, and then you can pick uh, multiple different ways you're gonna let a consumer log in to your store. Mm -hmm. So, one of the uh, cool things that we do with passwordless login is like typically you, you're probably exposed to an OTP, right? You enter an email, you get an OTP, and then you log in. We have, as Zumigo has uh, partnerships with uh, mobile network operators all over the world. And using which, uh, let's say you're interacting from a mobile phone as a shopper, and you uh, land at the merchant's website, you enter the email address uh, for your Shopify account, and in the background, we automatically figure out if this email address uh, has a corresponding phone number mm -hmm. in Shopify. And then if we detect, we have the ability to in real time detect if that interaction is happening from that device with that phone number on it, okay. right? So and it's called silent network authentication and it involves you know carrier uh, carrier interactions. So in that model, you can have a shopper login, just enter the email address and no password. If that phone number matches with what's on record for your Shopify oh, account, cool. we automatically let you log in, right? That is frictionless network authentication. So that's one flavor we support. And then we also have uh, you know, a couple of different flavors. We can send an OTP to your phone and you enter the OTP and then log in using the OTP. And if you have, uh, let's say you don't have a mobile phone, you can't get an SMS, uh, there can be a voice call. And then you can have a voice OTP delivered. You take the OTP and then you enter it into, into the login screen, you log in, or you just press a button. Are you trying to log into this store? You say press one and you automatically log in, right? So we're building many different flavors where a, a consumer landing on a Shopify merchant store doesn't have to remember a password. Email is not the only option. There's like multiple other options that the passwordless login lets you use. So the integration for the passwordless login, obviously it involves a customer facing UI, right? Because the, the customer is going to log into the website. So we've, we've developed the product in a no code fashion. There is no code required. 
the merchant installs the app, selects a login plan, and then you, the merchant has to go into a Shopify theme editor, right? So you open up a link we provide in the instructions and click a button. Basically it's like enable Zumigo passwordless login, de-riskify passwordless login. And as soon as you click the button and you hit save, your next login is now going to be completely supported by Deriskify. So it's easy to turn on and turn off. Once you turn it on, you can just log in using your phone, uh, OTP, or voice call. You don't have to worry about your password. That sounds like a very elegant and, and user-friendly solution that you have there. I mean, who remembers his Shopify password that you use once in a while, and then you have to look it up and it breaks the complete funnel and customer journey in your store. And a lot of people, I think, might just drop off and look for another place to buy if they can't find their password. And and as most shopping transactions nowadays happen on mobile devices with a phone number probably in the background, I think that's a very elegant solution that you have there. Now, how much of AI is involved in what you offer? AI is everywhere. Is AI something that is helping already, or is that something that's coming in the future? AI is involved. Uh, like Tarek mentioned, uh, we specialize in deterministic solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So I look at uh, any problem being solved using facts, which you've got to verify the facts. And then AI is about opinions, right? And opinions are predictive based on historical data. So we use both. So in the order risk verification, for instance, every element of the order is deterministically verified with an authoritative source. So in addition to the overall trust score, we give uh, individual scores. That's the phone uh, first name match with the phone numbers, uh, you know, on the in the carrier's record. Does the address match, right? Does the email match? So we've got lots of a la carte scores as a overall trust scores, but we also, you know, dip into past behavior. So we've got access to past consumer behavior, potentially flagged uh, pro fraudulent entries. And then we have anomaly detections, which detect for patterns. Is this an unusual way that this order is being placed or a login is being performed, right? Are you looking, are you doing it from a different location? We've never done it. Before. We've never seen before. Are you doing it from, you know, a VPN and potentially trying to mask your IP address, right? So there's lots of little signals that we look at which will feed into the model and come up with predictions. So our scores you know, will involve both data facts as well as you know, machine learning based predictions. And, and the same is true for passwordless login. You know, one of the things we do is you know, look at past login data. You know, how has login you know, come in from a known entity and how is it different now, right? So it is both fact as well as uh, AI which uses predictions. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to protect your store from fraud and scams uh, because, as um, Tarek mentioned, there is so many things involved that can cost you potentially money as a merchant um, that it should be very high on your list. Before we come to the end of the coffee break today, is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, I think, you know, so again, I would reiterate the point that, um, like you clearly mentioned, fraud is a billion dollar problem. Uh, and it is increasing uh, one of the statistics i just read before this call is it's increasing 16 percent year on year so that's a huge uh, uh, increase and in general the the uh, i think the e-commerce or basically commerce is moving to mobile phones so it becomes a lot more easier to get access to basically like there's a lot of uh, phone fraud involved right so sim swaps and a lot of different ways a fraudster can get access to your phone number and a mobile account, right? So it becomes uh, critical for uh, merchants to uh, consider all that and invest in uh, fraud prevention solutions. And uh, and that's that's how we are trying to build DSKFI for the future of commerce, right? So things would move into e-com, uh, uh, mobile commerce, shopping has moving moved already moved into mobile commerce. Passwords, um, I, passwords uh, are traditional. People forget passwords. People, I think one of the biggest problems for merchants in retention is forgot password link. They see a lot of drop-offs happen when someone clicks forgot password. The whole experience is um, not great for customers. So they tend to drop off. So the way we are combining our solutions 
with auto risk verification and authentication. So this could be a one-stop solution to uh, get the get uh, improved customer experience as well as uh, potentially reduce fraudulent orders. So in customers generally, when you, especially when you're a new merchant setting up a store, you're focused on you know how pretty your website is and how quickly you can fulfill how your labels look. So you're you're very focused on growing your business, but the moment fraud hits you, especially when you're small, you know you're just you take a step back. Like Tarek mentioned, every dollar that you spend, which is fraud, which is affected by fraud, you end up spending two times that on fighting it. Uh, a lot of merchants, you know, start looking at fraud only after the first fraud happens, right? And because they said this is expensive, I'm not going to invest. But the way the way we've built it. It's easy. You get signals, right? Even small companies who who just are starting their business can, you know, invest in a fraud detection solution, which is giving very valuable signals because somebody who is fulfilling an order, you just don't know whether this is a good order or not, right? And this is data that you should leverage. That I, you know, new new merchants start with. Yeah, making your store really attractive, pricing attractive, but also get a fraud detection solution in there. So you're pr pr protected from the get-go. Yeah, I would highly recommend that. I have been in a situation that you just mentioned, Harish, where it's like you get your first fraud order and you process it, and it's really a pain in the neck on so many different mm -hmm. levels, specifically emotionally. <laughs> so, <Right>. uh, <laughs> um, so you want to make sure that you're protected in the first place. Where can people find out more about you guys? So, it, I mean, on our website, zumigo.com, we have a section called Deriskify, or they can contact us through our contact us page on a uh, listing on Shopify, on Deriskify, so they can contact us. Or um, our LinkedIn's are public. You can always directly reach out to us as well uh, if, if they want to talk, if someone wants to talk to us directly. Mm -hmm. Cool. I will put the links in the show notes. Then you will be just one click away. And my recommendation to our listeners try it out, be safe. Make sure that you don't get scammed as a merchant and have the right fraud protection. Thanks so much for, your, for the talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Klaus here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show, and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? Fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision? But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks that have been holding you back. And this way, you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community and remember your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you there.